Hi, I'm Joyce Krieger and you're watching ArtLink, Conversations with Artists and Art Professionals. My guest today is Jeannie Rossier-Smith. She is a marvelous artist located here in Sudbury, Massachusetts, and Jeannie is a pastel artist. I would like Jeannie to, well, I'd like to welcome you and really you. hear a little bit about your background. Tell me where you went to school, where did you grow up, how many kids do you have, <laughs> you know, a little of everything before we get sure. into the technical. Well, all right, let's see. I uh, grew up in Maryland and I went to school at Georgetown University and I did not study art. Oh, that's interesting right off the bat. Right, I didn't know yeah. That. Well, I, well, you know, I, I was kind of torn when I was deciding what I wanted to study, and I was torn between English and art. I, I took a lot of fine art classes, and I remember having a conversation with my dad about it, and I said, what do, you, what do you think? Should I be a fine art major or an English major? And his comment was, I think you're a better writer than art artist really? yeah okay. which I probably was at Has the he time. lived to regret that yeah. I hope. <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> well I probably was because you know kids in elementary junior high high school aren't given as much art instruction as they are writing instruction so I'd actually been trained better as a writer at that point in my life so where did you turn and make this big change well not until I'd gotten a PhD in English Oh, wow. <laughs> so I taught English, college English, for 10 years. But meanwhile, I never stopped painting. I had painted, I really did always paint. I, it was a, just a, an intrinsic love. Always with pastel or with no, that No, I come actually later? discovered them about 20 years ago. But, oh. So I had done oils, watercolor, just drawing, charcoal. No lessons? Well, other I took a lot of classes in college. Oh, OK. Yeah. Uh, but no, other than that. So I had just always kind of continued on on my own. And then what happened was I was teaching part time and I was doing portraits of my kids. And I was mailed a box of new pastels by an uncle who lived in Western Mass. And he just put a little note in there, I think you might like these. Really? And he had no idea. I just- Changed your life. It totally did. I, it, there was, it was just sort of like a fish into water. All of a sudden I found my medium. What is about pastels? Because I hear so many people say they're really seductive. Oh, they are. In what way? It's like Because I've never worked with pastel, and I, I'm sure a lot of people in our audience haven't. So for me, it w really was love at first touch. Uh, I think it, I really do think that you find your medium, in, it's, it's got something to do with your personality. So for me, the reason pastel really, uh, really clicked was I love to draw and I love to paint, and pastel is a combination of the two of those things. And I'm kind of impatient, I like instant gratification. And so with pastel, there's no waiting for anything to dry. There's, you can layer color on top of color without any waiting. And the, I love the vibrancy and the richness of the colors. It's very direct, very tactile. When I was painting in oil, I found that I knew exactly what color I wanted, but knowing and getting to it there was a lag time because I had to stop and mix the colors whereas with pastel you have this kind of banquet of colors laid out in front of you at all times and so I can just grab the color I want and if I don't happen to have the color because the universal complaint of pastelists is I have all these colors but I don't have the color I want you can create the color you want by layering two or three colors together it's a different approach to painting because you mix the color directly on the paper or on the panel. So you, you create your colors by layering one on top of another. So you might get a neutral rose by layering a gray green on top of a brighter rose on top of an orange. And it, so it creates these, la these really subtle vibrations of color that you just can't get in any other way. Interesting fact, whether you know this or not, I don't know, but I'm sharing it with you and accordingly with our audience. Larry Horowitz and Wolf Kahn, mm -hmm. two major pastel pa painters. Right. Both of them have their pastels handmade and get whatever colors they want. Uh -huh. And Larry actually makes the pastel for Wolf Kahn. Oh, wow. So he makes these big, chunky yep. pastels that um, are very luscious. I've never, I've seen them, but I've never used them. Yes. 
So you tell me a little bit, because I watched your video today. Oh, great. And I was very impressed. In fact, you can check her out on YouTube because this woman is really amazing. To watch her do an entire painting while you're watching the video is spectacular. No waiting, you know, <laughs> no fast forward, it just happens. So I never knew that you did an underpainting under a pastel. Oh, yeah. And I was shocked. Tell us a little bit about that process. Right. To me, finding out about an underpainting, learning that I could do an underpainting was really, really key and completely changed. Tell our audience, because a lot so of the people out there aren't artists. Yes. What is an underpainting? How do you go about doing it? And then we're going to get back to your family, because we missed, oh, right, we kind right. of uh, zipped yeah, over that. So How did you get to Massachusetts? But let's do the underpainting for a minute, because I'm intrigued sure. with that. So an underpainting is, uh, the, the, I start on sanded paper, a paper that has a sanded uh, like a, a rough quality, very much, very similar to sandpaper, only it's archival. And I drag a dry pastel over the sanded paper, and it's basically I'm doing a custom toned uh, toning of the paper, like you would with an oil painting. So it's dragging dry pastel over the paper, and then I take a, usually a soft watercolor brush, a one-inch flat watercolor brush, and I dip it into rubbing alcohol, and so that it's just damp, and then I wash it over. So the alcohol is the medium the that actually spreads it. The alcohol is the medium. It. However, pastel is just dry pigment. It's the closest thing you can get to pure pigment. So it's you could just, use water. So you could use water. You could also, and many people use water, many people also use turpenoid or damsol. Which you would you use can in, use an oil oils, painting medium. Yeah. Right, you can also do an underpainting in watercolor. People who come to pastel from watercolor will often do watercolor underpaintings. Mm. So I like to use alcohol because it dissolves, it's a little thinner than water, it dissolves the pastel a little bit more quickly and efficiently. And dries more quickly. Dries more probably, quickly. Yeah. So it's, it's just easy to use. And um, so anyway, that's what I use. And what, what it does is it dissolves the pigment, it turns it into paint. And it's still pastel, but it's become I paint. was amazed at, when I looked at your YouTube video mm -hmm. and you looked at the underpainting. I could live with having that hung right. in my house. They're gorgeous. Yeah. And I've had people say that during demos. Why don't you just stop here? Right. And I've, I've been lately moving into considering doing abstracts, and I'm thinking that's really the way to go. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, they're gorgeous. Tell us a little bit about this sanded paper. Why aren't you all calloused? Because I know that you do right. a lot of blending. Well, and in the earlier years, I was. I had. Um, I would. My fingers would literally bleed sometimes. I can I believe that because really, I saw yeah. you rubbing over right. the sanded paper, and right. I'm thinking to myself, "This is a lovely looking woman. How come she doesn't have calloused hands?" <laughs> so lately, I've start. I, I use pipe insulation now. Sometimes, if I that, that you know those that sort of a black insulation that you can get the like the foam yeah. insulation over your pipes. That makes a great blending tool if you if you have an area that's really large that you need to blend. Uh, I try not to blend too much just because what that does is smash all the little crystals of pigment. And I like to leave, so I'll blend the first layer and then, then put fresh layers on top and try to leave them because those little crystals of pigment are what reflect the light and that's what gives oh. pastel its kind of velvety rich texture. So I try not to do too much of that. Uh, I try to just blend with the pastel stick itself you know, blend one color into the next. Well, more. I'm eager to hear and to have you talk a little bit about some of the particular pieces, but sure. for our audience sake, I'd like to go back to how did you get from Maryland to well, uh, so Sudbury? We moved around the country quite a bit. Uh, I married pretty young at 23, right out of, uh, right when I started graduate school. We were actually up in um, Boston. I was, I did my graduate degree at Tufts, and then we moved to Texas for five years, and I had two of my three kids in Texas. Then we moved to New Jersey for my husband's job. Where in Jersey? We were in Fanwood. No one's ever heard of it. It was about um, 1.3 square miles. I've actually heard. I'm from Have Summit. You? I'm from oh, Summit. Oh, um, when my third child was born in Summit. Oh, at the Overlook Hospital. Yeah, at so Overlook was I. Hospital. Oh exactly. my gosh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I Small love world. New Jersey. I love New Jersey. I couldn't wait to get out of it. Ah, we, we, we had a great time. It was, it was a really nice place to, for the kids to grow up. It's a good place to grow up, but yeah. it's a good place to leave. <laughs> if it well, wasn't so close to yeah. New York, I, right. would, I, I really yeah, would have bailed that earlier. That was really nice. Yeah. I loved living near New York. So we moved up here uh, 11 years ago, and that was a really good move for me. Uh, in terms of my art career, it was turned out to be a great place. What to, made you move? Was it your husband's work? It was my husband's work? job. Yeah. What and does he do, if I may ask? Well, we're divorced now, okay. but uh, he works for Novartis. Oh. <laughs> okay. Welcome, yeah. Novartis. Yeah. <laughs> Plug for Novartis. <laughs> right. Uh, so, um, 
it was a good move for our family. It was a good move for him. I mean, sorry, for, for me in terms of, um, in terms of just students, finding students I, I teach up here, and also just in terms of the art market up here, I think is really good. Well, I would so, think so. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about your teaching. You were sharing before we started the interview that you have every Tuesday 12 students and you have no more room for any more. Actually, I have three classes of 12. I have a morning class, an afternoon class, and an evening class. Oh 12 my God, people you're a each. masochist. <laughs> no, actually, it's just I... It, it's a it's a great way for me to be able to to have a steady income, support myself. I enjoy teaching. Say that out loud so that any of the artists out there hear that. Yes, because this is really important to a lot of the people who are listening to this. How does an artist survive Absolutely. and make a living? It's you have to find a balance between the regular teaching and then also time for my own painting. I have four or five galleries that I supply with artwork, and I have to leave time for myself to paint. And I also so. understand she, in order to save money, frames everything herself, which was amazing to me because I couldn't frame anything if I had to. I invested in all the equipment and I have recently found, one of my students actually has worked for a framer and knows what she's doing and I'm, I've hired Perfect. her. So she, she does my framing for me at my studio. Now you said you have, you're very prolific. Yes. What does that mean in terms of how many pieces do you do in a week, in a month, in a year? In a year, I, I average about 120 pieces a year. That's a lot. Framed pieces, like finished pieces. And they go immediately so, to the galleries. And they really do go immediately to, out to and galleries. And tell us a little bit about what galleries you're in, where are they located? So locally, I'm in Powers Gallery in Acton. They're great, I know them. I love yes. them. I've been with them for many years. And I'm with Gallery 31 in Orleans in, on Cape Cod. Mm -hmm and with Cecil Byrne Gallery in Charleston, South Carolina. Wow, how did you end up in a Charlestown? Uh, Again, I, I want my audience, yeah. because we have a lot of artists that listen to this broadcast and listen to it on Art Specifier, which is my website. And they love to know, how do you how get do you into get, a gallery? Right. In fact, I'm gonna be doing a whole webinar on venues where people can show their work coming up. And I want to hear a little bit about how did you get a gallery in that area? I was really lucky with this one because the woman who owns that gallery is from Duxbury and I knew her. And she moved down to Charleston and was setting up this gallery and she contacted me because she was aware of my wave paintings and she asked if I would join her gallery. You know, it's interesting because I have a number of gal a number of artists on our site that are from that area and they bemoan the fact that the art market down there is really tough for artists. Yeah. They really find it hard to get a gallery, hard to find an art consultant, hard to get some help in selling their work. Mm -hmm. So where else are you? So I uh, just recently joined a, uh, a gallery called Arnold Art in Newport. And that's that's a perfect location, right? It we is. We haven't it's really <laughs> gone into one of the things that this lovely, beautiful young lady does and does incredibly well are seascapes, and you'll be seeing a lot of them as we progress with this interview. But mm -hmm. I want you to talk a little bit about why seascapes, and you work from a photograph. But I happen to know that if you don't study that sea, you're not oh, yeah. happy. I do work from photos because I live in Sudbury. I don't live at the beach. If I lived at the beach, I'd be out on the... But how would you the, How would you be you, able but, to... You can't. Right. It, it changes every second. I do paint plein air when I'm there, but it's a different kind of painting. It's a different look. I, you can't get the, the really dramatic, uh, large-scale pieces that I do in of my the studio. Waves. Right, of the waves. Those I need to get... I have to photograph them. They don't stay still. You right, can't exactly. possibly do it. So I get more I like to do the more impressionistic pieces when I'm actually there. What I learn when I'm when I'm on the beach painting is the movement of the waves because when you look at a still photo, you don't see them you don't get the movement, you don't get the the rhythm of the well, waves. Well, you were talking about that the drawing actually emphasizes how you see the movement of the painting and right. you put that charcoal down after you put down the actual That's underpainting. Right. That's right. Yes. So I have to be able to imagine what's just happened and what's about to happen while I'm painting. I have to be able to see the wave moving in my head while I'm painting it. And the only way to do that is to spend an awful lot of time just watching the waves. Is there any other subject that is that complex? 
<laughs> I don't know. You know, I've been painting, I started painting waves about eight years ago, and you would think that I would get tired of it, but I have found that the more I've painted them, the more interesting they've become. For so me. talk to me a little bit about uh, the newest one we talked about, a chorus line that you just recently won something right. for. Tell so us. the chorus line I just finished. Uh, it's still in my studio. Oh, I haven't framed okay. it yet. Uh, it's just a little piece and I'm really excited about it and I'm planning on probably doing it really large. I like to do that. I'll do small. This is a little 18 So it's like 16. a study. It's a study and I'll, and I'll blow it up. The ones that I really like, I'll, I see a lot of interest in and I'll, I'll make it a much bigger painting. I call, you know, after you've done four or five hundred wave paintings, you're a little pressed to come up with titles. I but, would say. So a chorus line, this one made me think of, you know, maybe Radio City Music Hall girls all just dancing kicking up together. there. Yeah, all dancing together. So, and when I start a painting, I will do a little thumbnail and I try to come up with a, I, I write a couple words next to it. Maybe it's my English background, I don't know, but I come up with a visual idea and usually that will play into my title a little bit. So I come up with something that inspires me. So this particular one, I loved the, uh, the light and shadow, or the, the colors of in this, inside the shadow underneath the wave, and the ruffles, and the way that the ruffles Because I saw moved. a lot of purple in it, and I, yes. I didn't know where that came yeah. from. Often I will push the color a little bit to make it a little more interesting. I find that value is much more important in terms of getting the form to look realistic than color, which means I can play with the color. I can put whatever color in there right, I want right. and it'll, it'll work. So I like to have fun with the colors. Talk to me about In the Cool Shade. That's another one. It's actually a similar idea. That's one of my favorite recent paintings. It's a 24 by 24. Where is that? That, uh, where? Is you, that in a gallery? Is it, it is, sold? It, that one sold right away. Uh. Yeah, that one immediately sold. I'm trying to help you out here <laughs> in case we can get a little business for you. <laughs> that one just sold down in Charleston. I sent it down there and it sold within a week of sending it. Wow. Um, and what about Dive? Dive, I've just finished and I'm going to be sending it to the Charleston Gallery um, as, soon as, it's, as soon as I've got the frame for it. That's a little different than some of the other ones. Yeah, it's, it's very lacy. I was really interested in the intricate lace of the foam pattern in that one. That one was complex to finish because it, it really took a long time to play around with the foam. That wasn't one of those one day I can do it? No, it was not. No, because you know, you've got the, the complex f pattern of the foam and then it's also being swept up. So you've got to convey the, both the form, you know, the pattern on top of it and then also the, the movement. So. Talk to me a little bit about evening fanfare. Evening fanfare. So that's a dune, and that is Sandy Neck Beach. And I where is Sandy Neck? Sandy Neck is on the Cape. Okay. In Sandwich. Uh, I think I'm get. I think I've got that right. That's it's it's the the beach. It's the dunes. Those those beautiful dunes in. Trust me, if you didn't Sandwich. get it right, I'll hear about it. <laughs> My audience it's always Sandy sends Neck. me it's, texts. I love those dunes. Uh, they're in Sandwich, and I think it's this. I think it's called Sandy Neck, but I may be wrong on that. But it's these beautiful, gorgeous, just they go on forever. These beautiful sculpted dunes, and late afternoon, late evening, and early morning when the sun is low. That's when I like to go there and take lots of photos. It's a very difficult time to paint because the light moves really right, fast. Right. But I love to work from the photos and this it's that was late afternoon golden light on those dunes, which is perfect. How about glimmer? Glimmer was uh, that's on Nantucket and that was a tricky painting because it was a beautiful rosy sunset. And it, I really wrestled with that painting until I found this magic kind of raspberry color that showed up a little bit in the clouds. And I couldn't get it to work with the green marshes, which is what I saw. They were, it was actually green. And then I, I was in frustration. I grabbed that raspberry color and I just put a hit of it in the grass. And it was one of those aha moments. That's the artistic, yeah. you know, people who have an artistic <laughs> glint to their, they can do that. Most right. people would be terrified to pick up a color like that and well, add it, it to something. Well, it was just magic. And then I realized, oh, that's exactly what this needed. And I threw a little bit more of it, and that, that did it. And where is Far and Away? Far and Away is Nosset. I love your title. <laughs> that was Nosset. And, and that is, was Nosset in the off season, which is clear because there's nobody there. It was, it was just one of these spectacular. So you move around a lot. You don't just do one beach. Yeah, oh, no. I go all over the place. Yeah. Uh, I, well, I'm, yeah, I, I put a lot of miles on my car. You'll put a lot of sunscreen on? I'm worried <laughs> about you. I do put a lot of sunscreen And what about on. backyard beauty? Did you stay on a vacation? No, that's my backyard. Oh, so that's, that's the landscape. Backyard. Yeah. 
It's, it is, um, that's winter in my backyard. The snow is about two feet deep and it's the sunlight hitting the pine trees in my backyard. And I don't like plein air painting in the snow. I don't blame you. But uh, I do go, I just went and took a walk around in the backyard and snapped a bunch of pictures. And then I could actually see the scene out my kitchen window and could get some of the colors accurate. Snow painting is very frustrating from photos because the photos just don't capture the beauty of the colors. I would imagine they'd be a little bit difficult. Yeah. Let's go back a little bit to materials because I know that since we have a lot of artist audience. What do you, what kind of pastels do you do? What's the name of the paper? Why do you use these? And give them a little plug where you get them. Sure, since you mentioned uh, Wolf Kahn and handmade pastels, I love handmade pastels. My favorite pastels are Terry Ludwig pastels. Uh, who he, They make, the folks at Terry Ludwig hand make every pastel. And you can get those online? You can get them online. They have a factory uh, in, workshop in, Colorado and yes and I actually have a seascape set of pastels that I've put together that oh. you can get on my website. Oh cool. Um, but which is? Which my website is JeannieRosierSmith.com. Rosier is R-O-S-I-E-R. -E -E right. Uh, but and I also love Diane Townsend pastels which have a little bit of pumice in the pastels which make them kind of grippy. They grip onto the paper. Uh, and I love Blue Earth pastels. I love Giraud is another one. It's a French pastel. So you have all of them. Oh, these. you should see. I have a kitchen, a huge kitchen table up in my studio, and it's got four IKEA dinner trays, and each one is completely covered in a different wow. array of different colors. So I have an entire tray of blues, greens, reds, yellows, and neutrals. And, and you that's have like just a, one. You have a shopping list when you run out of one that you make <laughs> oh, yeah. sure you replace Oh yeah, the ones that I run it. out of are blues. And what about the paper? Because you casually yes. mentioned this interesting kind of paper. So there's a couple of brands that I use. They, there's lots of different papers. And I love to experiment, so I'll switch from one to another. UART is probably my go-to paper, U-A-R-T. And there's a new paper that's just come out Where recently. Where do you get that? Is that? That's online. Almost all the pastel supplies are, are online. It's, it's difficult to keep them in stock in most of the stores. Uh, so although there's a store in Concord that just started carrying UART paper oh, really? called Albright. Oh, yeah. Uh, Concord Mass. Yeah, Concord Mass. Perfect. Right. Uh, so there's a new pastel paper that's just come out called Pastel Premier. And, and how big does that go? That goes up to 27 by 40. That's a big size. So, yeah, yeah, it's a big size. And you can actually also get it in rolls if you want it bigger than that. I just got a big roll of it for working large. I was telling mm -hmm. you I wanted to work larger. Well, you, we were talking before yes. the show started a little bit about Jeannie might be going back to doing some oils and then because she wants to be able to work larger and it's more difficult in the pastels. Mm -hmm. It's more difficult for framing purposes. Yeah. yeah. I want to save some time to talk a little bit about your overseas ventures. <laughs> okay. Tell us a little bit about these travel experiences yeah. and how does one jump on the bandwagon if they want to join you and how how much do they have to know before they go? So yes, every year I host a trip somewhere and uh, this year in September we're going to the Amalfi Coast and next year... She told me I can't go but she's <laughs> it's full. full. <laughs> uh, next year we're going to Provence. Um, it does help to have a little bit of experience before you go. It's not absolutely necessary. You could go as a beginner. I've, I've got a supply list and you can start out as a beginner. I've had beginners come with me before. So it's not, it's not that it's a problem to start out as a beginner. The, the only reason I recommend that you have some familiarity is that when we, what we do is every day we go out and paint in a new location. So the more familiarity you have with the materials, the more fun you're going right, to have. Right, you know? right. So. What other things do you do? Let's say you've got a night for every single day that you're painting. Right. What do you so, do? So, on, for instance, on this Amalfi Coast trip, uh, the woman who's organizing the trip, Anne Moran, it's just for you travels. Anne Moran is, is um, the organizer. She has um, found a couple nights we've got a private chef coming into the villa that we've rented and fixing food for us. Is this just us. women or women no, and men? No, it's women and men. Uh, I think we have two men and the rest women. We have 11 Lucky people. Lucky them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So we have a private chef coming in. With the villas that we rented, have all have sea, the bedrooms all have sea views. One of the villas has a pool, and the other one is a little smaller awesome. nearby. And but it just looks really spectacular. I can't wait. But uh, and then we're going out to some restaurants. One day we're doing a farm tour, like an agricultural tour. Yeah, and we're going to learn how to make limoncello and mozzarella and that sort of stuff. So it's a little bit of tourism Culture stuff as well. Tour. Right. We're going to visit a uh, villa, a, a famous um, villa, and paint there. Have you figured so. out the trip after that yet? Well, the, the trip after that is Provence next June, and after that, I haven't figured that out yet. And what about some of the past ones? We've gone to Provence three times already. Oh, so you I really love like this that. one trip. Okay. Well, also because my sister lives in southern France, and I know the area really well. I studied in Nice when I was. Why does this sound in like college. a tax deduction to me? <laughs> <laughs> I <I'm> work <laughs> really hard on this trip. Although I have to say, when I'm driving around on these cliff sides and thinking, I'm getting paid to do this. This is amazing. You know? So how did you get it's that fun. started? We only have a few minutes you know, left, but I'd like to hear I just, that. Well, the first trip uh, was it was with the Concord Art Association. Uh, they host trips. Concord Mass has an oh, art association. They right. host travel trips. And, and you liked that they, idea? Well, they, they asked me to do one one time, and then I wanted to, uh, everyone, it, it filled up really quickly, and people wanted to go back again the next year, and they told me, we only go to the same place once. We don't go back to the same place. So I organized my own trip. I love it. <laughs> so I've been doing it ever since. And I yeah. think if somebody wants to jump on the bandwagon and they have a little bit of experience doing pastels, do they go to your website? And right. I, all of my w workshops are listed on my is website. Is the Provence one open? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. How many people are signed up already? Well, we, ha we have, I think we have about eight people so far who are interested. It's not until next June. So can I get a quick lesson on so, pastels and go? Sure. Yeah. Sounds like a blast. That'd really, be great. I love to it's do that. It's really fun. Somebody yeah. approached me recently that does um, art and cultural travel, and she was telling me about what she does, and it's wonderful. I should give you her name. Oh, yeah. yeah it's Sharon should. something, but I'll find out for you. Yeah. And anything else you want to share with our audience? Because we're going to wind up in about a minute. Tell me anything else that's, what's the most important thing in your life in terms of art? You like, know, what does art mean to you? To I me, think that's the question I usually it ask. It is my way of being in the world. I don't think I could, I, I can't imagine my life without it. It is, I have been truly happy ever since I switched to doing art full time. It's definitely my, And um, you're able to support yourself? Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. Do you have kids going yeah. to college yet? I have uh, one, my, one who's graduated. He's 24. Where one did he go? He went to Villanova. Oh, cool. And he's at Texas Instruments in Dallas. And then I have a daughter who just graduated from Quinnipiac, and she's going to get a master's in teaching. And I have a son who's at the Berkeley School of Music. A creative a family. Yeah. Well, what I do want to say for all of those of you listening out there, this is a woman who's truly been able to do what she wants, make a living at it, enjoy her family at the same time, and travel. To me, yeah. that's a plus. <laughs> I want to thank you so much for coming. Thank it was you awesome so much. to meet you Great and to meet awesome you to hear all about your life.